particular so position. Soldier fired an RPG on rifle propelled grenade through the underside, which is the thinnest part of the tank. And that injured the driver, but he managed to get the vehicle out of action. So um, even then it wasn't a fatal incident at all, but quite dramatic. And they're the only two occasions when Challenger 2 has even been hit, which is quite remarkable. It's really very resistant. And in this day and age, when symbols like the body bag are so vitally important, then quite clearly you need a, um, a, a something like this. It means the crew are going to survive any action which they go into. The Challenger 2, if you look at it, is covered in a... Um, well, it looks like a set of pyjamas, someone described it as the other day. It's actually a thermal coating. It's made by, um, by um, Rheinmetall in Germany. It's called the Solar Shield. And the purpose of it is actually to keep the heat that's generated by the tank somehow inside. It prevents the tank from giving off a thermal signature, which these days can be detected. Of course, in the Mark IV, it didn't make any difference. They didn't have anything like that. Clouds of smoke came out of it anyway. So you... Um, you just judged it by that. You didn't worry about thermal imaging and that kind of thing. Um, and that really makes the tank that much different. So the other thing that the um, pyjamas do is cut down its radar in its symbol. So as the rounded edges of the, um, the fabric are, are going over the armour, they tend to reflect less radar. And even that helps nowadays on the battlefield. And you don't want to be identified if you can help it to the last minute. Though the noise it makes you think you can hear it a mile off. Um, that's quite a quite a change now. Um, so it is on most modern tanks. Now the power unit's worth discussing. The um, original Mark IV, 105 horsepower, six-cylinder petrol engine. Now I say Daimler. But it was Daimler of Coventry, it was the British company, and nothing to do with the original German Daimler company. So it's quite a British building. Now in Challenger 2, you've got a Perkins V12 turbocharged diesel, which develops for about 1,200 horsepower. So you can see the tremendous difference there. It means that Challenger 2 can move at, oh, what shall we say, 59 kilometers an hour, about 37 miles an hour. Whereas the poor old Mark IV goes along at about three miles an hour, about walking pace, because that's all they needed in those days. And without suspension, you can want to go as slowly as possible. So even those things are remarkably different. It means that this tank behind me can really put the foot down and go. Quite impressive. Now the next thing is the turret. Of course, the Mark IV doesn't have a turret. It has sponsons on the side, and it's actually a male tank. He had female tanks with machine guns. But the male had a six-pounder in each sponson with about a 90-degree arc of fire. It had quite a good range, but you had to, you really fought at ranges you could see. So you really are lucky if you're firing more than a kilometre at a time. Whereas Shelley II, could pick up a target up to four kilometres away and hit it, it's been done. And that's quite remarkable in itself. The Challenger 2's got a 120 millimetre rifle gun and the reason we in Britain have a rifle gun where everybody else has gone for a smooth war is that it fires a better nature of ammunition. So that's at least one of the reasons for it. And it means that it puts us a bit apart from everybody else. The, um, alongside the main gun is a chain gun, which is like a, a machine gun, really, which they use as an auxiliary weapon, or as an alternative weapon, really, for use against infantry and soft skin vehicles. So the Challenger 2 is quite well equipped in that sense. It's got a number of other things. Um, on top of the turret is another machine gun station. That's remote control, and it can be worked from inside the turret. The loader actually operates it, and he, he can fire it without getting out of there, exposing himself at all. There are two other things. On top of the, the gun, there is the, um, the image intensifier. It's the 
looking up above the gun, and that it works like a sight. It puts the guns back on target every time. There's also a laser rangefinder, which is in front of the commander's component. Now that works by using a laser, and it means that the, the commander can actually select a target, and that's indicated straight away to the gunner, but then well, as soon as that's done, the commander goes on to the next target and takes that. So he can pick up two targets at a time and move on to another one after that if he wants to, which is quite remarkable in itself. Well, that's nearly covered the, the heavy tanks really, and give you some idea, it's only brief, but it'll give you some idea of how things have progressed in the last hundred years. I mean, just an example, the drivers provided with a camera, or at least the camera's on the back of the vehicle, and he can actually see what he's going when he's reversing. So there's none of that business of the commander having to con him back or anything like that. It's all done from inside the tank. Now the Charlie 2 has a crew of four. That's a commander, a gunner, loader, and a driver. The old Mark IV had a crew of eight. Of that was eight, four of them were needed to drive the vehicle. They had the commander working the steering sticks. The driver sat on his right and he worked the gear lever. But you had two extra gearsmen at the back so the tank could steer. So that's four of them. The other four would be the gun screws. You'd have two men, a gunner and a loader on each male, on each side of the male tank, and then machine gunners on each side and the, the female. So you still need eight people. It was quite labour intensive. But you can walk around inside the Mark IV just about. If you don't touch anything, it's too hot. But um, the challenge of two, you're in your seat and you have to stay there. And I thought, well, since I'm standing in it, I might as well give you a quick... It's virtually a copy of the type produced by the Royal Air Service in 1914. So it's, um, it's slightly more modernised, but still using the same chassis, which is the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost chassis with a 40-50 horsepower straight six engine. And it's covered with eight millimetres of armour, and the armour covers the engine, the turret and fighting compartment, but not here at the back. It's, it's wooden at the back because they use they just store the lockers and things don't matter in there. It's got double wheels and uh, really it's two. It's not four-wheel drive, so when it goes anywhere, like over mud or over sandy desert. It does it quite well, and you, you wouldn't believe it wasn't, wasn't really four-wheel drive then, because it really has the power to do it. Well, that's just about it, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'll call the hall there, and uh, get driven off and put away till next year, and uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, please, for Mr. David Fletcher, past historian here. Celebrity awarded MBE some years ago. We did here at the museum. David, thank you very much indeed. Enjoy your lunch. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's just.